Hello, I'm Scarlett Fu. Welcome to Bloomberg Front Row. Today, I'm talking to Franklin Templeton President and CEO Jenny Johnson. She just became the fourth member of her family to lead the investment firm her grandfather founded more than 70 years ago. But she's taking the reins at a turbulent time for the asset management industry. Jenny believes the finance world needs to change its image and accentuate the positive. I think we're often by the media thrown in as just, you know, you guys are a bunch of greedy Wall Street people. The reality is I can tell you the colleagues that I work with, uh, my peers in the industry, really try to focus on what's doing right for clients. We discussed Franklin Templeton's $4.5 billion purchase of Leg Mason, the future of asset management, her firm's strategy in a time of competition and consolidation, and diversity as a leading woman in a male-dominated field. I was asked by an employee at one point, well, what do you do when you walk in a room and you know that all the men are thinking uh, that you're not capable or you know competent? And I said, boy, I've never walked in the room and thought that. And by the way, never let that be in your head. Here's my conversation with Jenny Johnson. I want to start on the Leg Mason purchase. Uh, Franklin Templeton announced Leg Mason purchase in February, right before COVID hit and sent markets reeling. You closed the deal ahead of schedule. How has your thinking on the necessity of this deal evolved as market conditions have changed? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because when, when it happened, of course, as you mentioned, the market tanked with, uh, with COVID coming on and we never lost sight of the fact this was a growth story for us. We're long-term in how we think about the business. Um, for us, it was about an all-weather product lineup, filling in product gaps, gaps that we had, uh, really diversifying our client base. We're now 50-50 retail institutional and frankly, greater scale in really important markets like Japan, Australia, and the UK. And so, um, you know, we, we tend to run this business over the long term. It, it, that minor kind of set setback, we still felt like it's it was absolutely the right thing to do. But if you were to look back in a perfect world, is there any part of the deal that you wish you could redo maybe? No. All good, even the price, given how much uh, markets have fallen since then. Well, markets has uh, you know are, are coming back up, and so uh, again, when you, the hard part about asset management is rarely do people sell when markets go down. So uh, you know the alternative was maybe that that deal wouldn't have been available to us. Uh, you, you know you can't control the markets, uh, but we can control our strategy. We can control uh, again the the key to having really an all weather product lineup. So regardless of where the market is and where the economy is, there's there's something that's appropriate for clients. Now, when it comes to the integration of the two firms, is there anything that may, might change when it comes to your plans because of the new normal that we're living in? So I, what made the Leg Mason deal work for us is we've always, as you know, we've done large asset management deals in the past with Templeton Mutual Series, um, you know, high net worth business, fiduciary trusts, and, and frankly, a lot of them across the globe, and most recently, Benefit Street Partners. What we understand is that we are buying an investment team and an investment process. So we have always left those as independent, sitting on a base, a very powerful base of, of you know, technology risk management. And we think the world going forward, that things like data analytics can be more and more important. So the ability to bring that in and spread it over a bigger base is, is, is better. Well, Leg Mason was structured exactly with that, with its what they called affiliates, so the individual investment teams reporting into a holding company. And so our complete focus on immigration has been uh, at the holding company level, you only need one holding company, and combining distribution, because obviously you need you know just a, one team servicing your clients. And so bringing those together and, and uh, you know, it was, it was a, it was different in that we had to do this assessment uh, via video. That wasn't what we were planning on doing, but it actually we closed 30 days early. So I think it worked out pretty well. Franklin Templeton now has $1.4 trillion in AUM, reversing years of falling AUM. What's the significance of being in the $1 trillion club? Well, I, I think what is key is our business, there's a lot of pressures on, on the business. Um, and, and I think one, really important component of active management is going to be this need to get massive amount of data and to get data insights from non-traditional sources. So whether it's social media sentiment, um, whether it's satellite photos, I mean, we've heard all these kind of stories around it, but 
this is going to be very important to any active manager. And so the, the, the really the, the, the deeper your data lake and the wider your data, width, the breadth of your data lake uh, is going to be able to give you greater insights. And so we think being able to, to spread that type of initiative across a broader uh, client base is, is you know, better. Let's talk about active management because now, if any, is the time for active to shine. Um, if you can't do it now in this period of upheaval and volatility, the perception that your company or the industry at large is in deep trouble, is in some kind of long-term secular decline becomes that much harder to shake. Can you talk a little bit about the pressure to get this right, right now for Franklin Templeton and for the industry overall? Well, first of all, passive tends to do very well in momentum markets, right? It's a market cap weighted. And I want to talk about this from an equity standpoint and then a fixed income standpoint. So from an equity standpoint, you have six stocks in the S&P 500 that has you know, basically generated 10 times the return of the rest of the S&P 500, right? So if, if you were an active manager and you underweighted any one of those six, it probably didn't matter that you got the sector bets or the individual stock bets in the other sectors right, because there was such a barbell as far as returns. I don't think that carries forward at the same level. And so, you know, we look at it just today, I was having a conversation with our, our, uh, our biotech team and, you know, we have PhD uh, scientists on our biotech team. And you think about all the companies that right now are talking about the vaccines that they're now developing and how that's impacting their market cap. Well, you know what the biotech teams come at to me was, Jenny, good science is what translates into good returns. You have to understand the approach on these. That's fundamental analysis. That's having people who are so steeped in individual sectors and understanding behind them that they can make those picks. I think that becomes very important going forward. And then I just say on the fixed income side, look, you know, the fact, if you just think conceptually that passive fixed income is about when companies take on more debt, you're increasing your exposure. That, that, that just doesn't make sense, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous way to, I think, to, to have an investment strategy. You know, I know our muni group and talking to them when, when COVID hit and they had the benefit of understanding already the credit uh, worthiness of various states and municipalities. Uh, and then they could pivot when they looked at it and said, wow, this is gonna impact certain sectors are very vulnerable to this healthcare, transportation, and other sectors are immune. So they can pivot their investment strategy to take advantage of those moments very quickly because they have that deep understanding. I get the deep understanding, and certainly on the equity side, uh, the ability to do the uh, detailed analysis is invaluable. But I wonder how much of it comes down to human versus machine, because you've got better technology, you've got uh, systematic strategies, all of which have shown that humans are not very good necessarily at consistently picking winning securities over the longer term. I mean, that's just kind of what the numbers bear out. So over the longer term, does technology win out? Yeah, no, so I mean, I, I tend to uh, view it as it's a hybrid. The data is going to be very, very important, but here's what data doesn't tell you. When something externally changes, you know, the Fed changes their policy, uh, the ECB changes their policy, there's some regulation that comes in. You have to have the, com the, the combination of both people and data. And that's where I think active management is evolving, where you're bringing those two things together. Do you think we'll see the move from active to passive slow or stop in the next couple of years? You know, the, the, the big question that I think, you know, you're seeing is, is with the percentage of passive, um, does that become kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy? And, and yeah. um, you know, it, it's fast on the way up and we saw it in those couple of months on the way down, it's even faster, right? There's no buy bid on the, on the passive model on the way down. Active's gonna ha shine as the next decade's gonna look very different from the last. I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, sensitivities that companies are gonna have to be able to maneuver, including supply chains. And so being able to fundamentally get under the covers and understand the impact of these types of decisions is gonna be important. And then of course, ESG, I think is, a, is an area that you benefit from active management. When you look at your rivals in the fund management industry, it's clear that some were positioned pretty well for some pretty big shifts. BlackRock, for instance, with the rise of passive and ETFs that target specific sectors or markets, Eaton Vance with tax efficient products. What do you think is the next big shift in the industry and therefore for Franklin Templeton to capitalize on? 
So I think customization is going to be very important. And I, I think that, that people um, often discuss ETFs as being synonymous with, uh, with passive, and it's not really that. An ETF is just a vehicle to deliver capabilities. It has different characteristics than other vehicles like SMAs or um, you know, CITs, Collective Investment Trusts. And so what we view as you know, Franklin Templeton, we have investment capabilities across the full spectrum we will deliver them in whatever way in which our clients want them delivered in whatever vehicle, including really customized separate accounts. And that's where technology is enabling you at a, at a much smaller account size to deliver more customization. So I think that we're going to see more of that. So that leads me to my next question. The 60-40 portfolio is kind of the bedrock of the modern asset management industry, but we know that the relationship between asset classes has changed quite a bit. People buy stocks for dividend payouts, for income. People buy bonds to participate in price rallies, and interest rates are lower for longer. Is 60-40 dead? <laughs> You know, I think 6040 is a blunt instrument, and we have more tools uh, to fine tune the management. Now, uh, you also had uh, a, an issue with the 6040, and that a lot of institutions had, say, a 7% target, and their fixed income was yielding such low returns that they found themselves having to move further on the, on the risk curve. And so you saw them go into alternatives. Um, so I think that the, the real answer is it's not that 6040 was bad. Uh, it's just that we have better tools to fine tune for, for folks individual goals and you're going to see more of that customization. When we look at what's going on there, there's a ton of liquidity floating around. There's an everything rally where risky assets and safe havens are both rising. What do you think success in the asset management industry hinges on most in that kind of environment? Is it alpha generation? Is it leveraging scale or is it something else? So I think the key for the asset management is what value are you bringing to your client, right? And so really understanding what your client's needs. If it's a pension fund, it's a series of cash flows, you know, liability-driven investment. They need portfolios that are structured for that. I think what's happening on the retail channel is because the world's gone to fee-based, clients are looking at their financial advisor and saying, you know what, it's not enough that you just give me an investment portfolio. I want you to help me do financial planning. I want you to have you know, a tax efficiency in this. I, I may even want you to educate my, my children on how to be financially savvy. And so as those additional demands are, are um, you know, coming on us from our clients, it's about meeting those needs and, and really showing value for, for you know, what you're paid. And meeting clients' needs also means expanding your product offerings. Uh, you have a venture fund, you have private equity, you have private credit. How are you building up these different areas? Are you doing it through acquisitions or are you building it up, building it up on your own internally? So it depends. You know, I mean, we we were fortunate to get Clarion, a really phenomenal real estate manager manager with the uh, Leg Mason acquisition. Um, in general, private assets are a little bit difficult to buy because. Uh, the people selling them, I say, they always have more information than you do. Uh, and so, you know, we have taken the approach that at times, and we'll, we'll buy it. We bought Benefit Street Partners, um, and, and that was private credit. In the case of private equity and venture, we've started to organically grow our own. You know, we're, we're headquartered in the heart of Silicon Valley. So we, you know, I like to say we have uh, uh, you know, social events we used to uh, pre-COVID uh, with, with a lot of these entrepreneurs as well as venture capitalists. And so um, it gave us kind of a front row seat to that. So that approach was more of an organic approach. How much more consolidation do you think we'll get in the asset management industry? Are we in the second inning, the fourth inning? So there's certainly been predicting for the last probably at least five, maybe even 10 years, there was going to be this massive amount of consolidation. And you started to see it. There's been some big deals. Um, I think that the, again, the, the, the one, the, the pressure on the industry on fees is going to have um, a push towards consolidation. I think the investments required in things like data science, um, and, and when I talk about data science, it's investments in AI, investments in natural language processing, all those supporting the investment teams. I haven't even talked about the investments on the fintech side for distribution. I mean, there's massive amount of investments that have to happen there. Uh, one of the key drivers on our, our Leg Mason deal is we knew we had to have cash on our balance sheet. It was very important to us post deal. We have $5 billion in cash and investments precisely because we want to have the flexibility to continue to make these investments. That's hard to do when you're small.
Franklin Templeton is known for Mark Mobius, who left a firm in 2018 for its emerging market prowess. Obviously, things have changed and you've grown through acquisitions. What do you think is a Franklin Templeton brand now? What do you want it to be known for? I, we want it to be known for helping people solve the most difficult problems that they have in their life. And I think that, uh, I think actually as an industry, we got to do a better job talking about what we do. You know, I think we're often by the media thrown in as just, you know, you guys are a bunch of greedy Wall Street people. The reality is I can tell you the colleagues that I work with, uh, my peers in the industry really try to focus on what's doing right for clients. And if you think about, you know, you, 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 you think about as we're having an aging population, as people are moving into retirement, are they saving enough? Have we helped them save enough? Um, do they have the appropriate uh, strategies as they're living longer to ensure that they can stretch out what they've saved? Uh, if you have, you know, if you know somebody who has a special needs child, one of the great fears is will there be enough money once I'm gone to have to ensure that this child is taken care of? Uh, those are the things that are real. And then you just think about what's happening today with with uh, vaccine development. These are public companies who are out there who are using the dollars of our shareholders, right? You know, the investors and and the profits and 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 trying to develop really important needs for society. So. Uh, to us, Franklin Templeton is a part of this. We are helping people solve the most important goals in their life. The business of asset management is really based on the idea that humans can beat the markets in a meaningful way over a long period of time consistently. Some would call that an anachronism. It's certainly a goal. I think about the people who do that job, star fund managers. We don't hear about them anymore. Why don't we have them anymore? Why doesn't the industry promote them anymore? You know, I mean, the, the interesting thing with the with the star fund manager uh, is that the reality is they were always supported by a large team. I think maybe it was easier for people to connect and and um, maybe maybe from a marketing standpoint, we'd say, oh, it's you know X person who's really behind this. But the reality is it was always a team, uh, and so that's one. And then number two, clients get nervous by star managers if you point one because then then it becomes a succession succession issue. Uh, they want to know that you can seamlessly are developing the team behind, just as any CEO is expected to be developing the team behind them. Uh, and so I think that that's, that's been much more of the focus is talking about that team, but it's always been a team. Yeah, but start fund managers help differentiate different firms. Mark Mobius was always tied to Franklin Templeton. If you don't have someone recognizable, people can turn to price as their primary driver, and then they it's that much easier for them to go to a passive product or to an ETF. Well, again, um, I, I, ETFs are a vehicle, so you can take active. I mean, we, we I think our I think our largest, maybe it's the second largest largest category, our largest category, we just hit 10 billion in ETFs. Um, is in the it, it, smart beta, um, multi-factor, and then the next one's active. And we have the cheapest passive out there, but it's the smallest category for us. So again, ETFs are our vehicle. Um, you know, you're gonna have to show value. That We've talked about that. There's no question you're gonna have to show value. And I think people like to understand the strength of the team versus a single individual uh, making all the decisions. That they recognize that that's just not credible with all the information you have to gather, uh, the, the deep understanding that you have to have in individual sectors and, and analysts, um, that, that it's just not credible to say one person can do all those things. When we talk about fund managers, at least in this country, it tends to be he or him. Why have we not had any female star fund managers? And do you see that changing? Well, you know, I, it, it is something that we're very focused on, um, and we've had uh, as high as, uh, I think, 27%. Uh, as we've done acquisitions, that's diluted our number a little bit, but I think we were always a firm that, uh, that had a lot of uh, strong women uh, as managers. Uh, I think that the industry is uh, learning, you know, we in, are involved in something, girls who invest, get, get girls interested earlier in this business. But part of that's also, my, my daughter said to me, you know, mom, I don't really want to go into your type of business. I want to help people. And I'm like, you know, this business helps people. Uh, and so if we can articulate it in that way and, and get to girls earlier. I think that you're going to find more are attracted to it. Um, so it's casting the net more broadly. It's communicating what we do really in terms of a purpose. And I think we'll, we'll see more and more women into the business. If attracting and retaining women is as important as we claim it is, how directly tied is that to how you're thinking about remote work plans? 
So I, I you know, I, as a mother of five and as the daughter of a mom who had seven children and then graduated from Stanford Medical School, you know, I, I think that moms have to figure out how to blend work and, and home life really, really well, which means we need a little bit more flexibility. And, and so I think that this whole work life, one is you take out the commute, you know, um, two, you can get up and take care of whatever you need to get up and take care of. Um, so I think in many ways it will play to the strength of women. I also think that men have been a little bit disadvantaged. And I know a lot of men that would love to coach their kids, you know, uh, sports teams, and yet they weren't sure that was okay in the office. Uh, and so I think this environment's actually going to allow both parties to do more of this integration between home and work. Uh, and I think that that's better for everybody. Do you think the male leaders in finance and other industries see this crisis the same way you do? So it's been very interesting listening to other CEOs' views about whether this new work is, is permanent or are we going to absolutely go back to where we've been? And we have this, our own question around, you know, sort of what does the office look like? Um, you know, I think the reality is you've got a top performing employee who, who, you know, commutes three hours a day, 90 minutes each way, not an unusual commute in, say, New York City. And they're just realized they can do a lot of their job from home. I think we're going to all have to learn to figure out how to accommodate and leverage technology to create those kind of collaboration opportunities. Um, so I don't know quite what the world's going to look like. I mean, it is a debate we have, but I think it's going to look different. Jenny, you are the fourth member of your family to serve as CEO of Franklin Templeton to lead the firm. How do you reconcile that and your efforts to promote diversity at the firm with the fact that this is ultimately a family run business? Well, so first of all, we're a public company. And while the family has a significant interest in it, uh, we, uh, you know, we're, we're minority shareholders. We don't own a majority of it. So we have to run it every day as a public company and think about what's right for the long run. I'd say the one difference is that when you have still founders having concentrated ownership, they're really able to think more long-term as far as investments that they make. You know, one of the risks today of public companies is CEOs have so much pressure for quarterly returns uh, that sometimes it, there's a question about whether they're really making the best long-term decisions for the business. And I can tell you, we operate this company thinking in the long-term for the business. Is there any discussion at all about potentially going outside the family for future CEO appointments? So it was always a, a possibility as far as going outside the family. And, um, you know, it's not clear whether the next generation of Johnsons are interested in, in this business or not. So, you know, they have to prove themselves as everybody else does. Uh, and, and they have to really want it. You know, th this is a complicated business. We have offices in 35 countries, over 100 offices, clients in 160 countries. You spend a lot of time traveling, a lot of time working. Uh, if I didn't love it and be passionate about this business, I, I wouldn't be any good at it. And so, uh, you know, I think any CEO has to love what they do. And I love what I do. I want to talk a little bit about what happened uh, with the Amy Cooper situation three months after that unfortunate incident. I wonder what has changed at your firm. How do you monitor employees' behavior and stay on top of what they say and what they do? So, you know, part of it is you, you have to, from the very top of the firm, behave in a certain way and just show zero tolerance for any kind of racism, racism or discrimination. Um, you know, at my core, I fundamentally believe, and I believe their executive committee fundamentally believes that a diverse workforce is better for us, better at decision making because you're going to get more views, uh, better because it reflects our diverse client base. Uh, and so it's about for us continuing to re, always rethinking how can we ensure greater diversity and inclusion. And as I, uh, you know, uh, we, we hired prior to the incident in Central Park the uh, chief diversity and inclusion officer at Leg Mason and Regina Kerr is reporting directly to me as a CEO. That's how important DNI is to, to Franklin Templeton. DNI is clearly something that you're very passionate about and I can hear it in your voice. I can see it in the way you're talking about it. How do you think your lived experience heightens your perception of what's happening on the diversity front? I, you know, in some ways I, I always feel a little bit um, you know, obviously I'm a woman CEO, but I, you know, grew up in a household where my father celebrated 
uh, strong women. I mean, uh, you know, my mother uh, as a, I think she was one of 10 women graduating from Stanford Medical School. And so, um, you know, I, I've always grown up in this environment uh, where there's just somebody who believed in me. And I think that makes a big difference. Um, you know, I was asked by an employee at one point, well, what do you do when you walk in a room and you know that all the men are thinking uh, that you're not capable or, you know, competent? And I said, boy, I've never walked in the room and thought that. And by the way, never let that be in your head, right? Why, why use up any of your mind share to think those things? So I think I'm very fortunate, but, um, you know, you got to talk to people, you got to listen to people and so that you can understand what their experiences are. Thank you, Jenny, so much for spending some time with us and uh, sharing your thoughts. Jenny Johnson, CEO and president of Franklin Templeton. Mm -hmm.